Good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Semino. I'm the administrative commissioner for New Jersey, current chair of the commission. We're going to start policy board today. I uh, I will be playing DJ for the rest of this winter meeting, and uh, the request line is already full. So uh, we're getting started a few minutes late. We've got a lot a lot to cover today. So I'm going to go through approval of the agenda. Are there any agenda items that need to be added? Let's start with David Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to have a very couple of minutes to talk about straight bass, please. Yes, thank you, David. And I, I realize there's a time constraint there for you, so we will take you after public comment. Um, and uh, I, I think the board chair for straight bass as well. Go ahead, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have a, a process issue with lobster that we need to address, so we need to add that to the agenda if we could as well, please. Duly noted, and um, I think if we can, we'll do that at other business. Uh, to cover David's thing, we'll do that a little earlier. Thank you. Uh, yeah, great. Okay, Chris Wright, go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Chris Wright, No Fisheries. I just have a short uh, announcement regarding an ESA petition on uh, horseshoe crab. I just have a short little uh, statement to make. I, yeah, could do it I could either do it after we do the agenda or in other business. Yeah, if it's okay, we'll take that in other business. Thank you. All right, so a few additional items. Uh, and with that, I will go to the approval of the proceedings from the uh, October 2023 meeting. Any uh, concerns, additions, edits? Not seeing any hands. Good. Um, if I could get a show of hands online and in the room for public comment. I see one in the room. And I have one hand online, just making sure there's not anybody else. Okay, let's uh, do this on an even number here. We it looks like we have two people, and we'll give uh, two minutes to each speaker. And we'll start in the room, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Let's try again. All right, start now, all right? Mr. Chairman, my name is Phil Zalzak. I'm president of the Southern Maryland Recreational Fishing Organization, better known as SMURFO. SMURFO, along with the Chesapeake Legal Alliance, has brought a lawsuit against the state of Virginia for violating Virginia code regarding the management of Atlantic Menhaden Reduction Fishery in Virginia waters. The lawsuit is ongoing. We have also filed a petition for rulemaking to request and direct the state of Virginia to end Atlantic Menhaden reduction fishing in the Chesapeake Bay and its entrance. I'm here today to respectfully request that the commission hold an Atlantic Menhaden Manager Board meeting this spring. Why? Current commission policy is based on the false assumption that Atlantic Menhaden biomass density in the Chesapeake Bay is the same as the Atlantic Ocean. The science and the prevailing science is that they are not the same. In fact, the latest science and empirical data provided by this commission, the state of Maryland, the state of Virginia, and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration supports a position that localized depletion is occurring in the Chesapeake Bay. Given that localized depletion of Atlantic Menhaden of Chesapeake Bay has been an issue with this commission without resolution under the current process since 2004, I request the following. The commission hold an Atlantic Menhaden management board meeting this spring. The meeting will be structured in the form of a debate, a discussion, and a decision on the future of Atlantic Menhaden reduction fishing in the Chesapeake Bay and its entrance. This proposal is supported by the Virginia Saltwater Sports Fishing Association, recreational fishing organizations, 
Maryland's Tidal and Coastal Recreational Fishing Committee, the National Audubon Society, and the Virginia Osprey Foundation. This is a very reasonable request, which should be acted on as soon as possible. I thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Appreciate that and uh, appreciate you being so timely. We had a couple of extra hands here, so um, we'll keep moving through. Uh, next up is Tom Lilly. All right. Um, can you hear me? Am I getting through? Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen of the uh, policy board, in the last year, grim evidence of Menhaden over harvesting in Chesapeake Bay has piled up. Starvation of thousands of osprey chicks and the failure of the striped bass spawning stock. Despite public outcry and the effect that this is having on millions of Chesapeake Bay residents, repeat, millions of Chesapeake Bay residents and their children and their grandchildren. Despite all of this, the Menhaden Board has refu refused to meet in October, November, and they are refusing to meet right now. From the New York and New Jersey experience and your ERP science, we, we know very clearly how Chesapeake Bay would benefit by moving the factory fishing. We're talking about one company here, as you know, by moving them into the US Atlantic zone. There's no question about that. Have you all stopped to think that by, by refusing to meet, by the Menhaden, Menhaden board refusing to meet, that you have dashed the hopes of numerous groups, thousands if not millions of people, that our Chesapeake Bay wildlife would get the Menhaden forage they need this year. That hope is gone. It's gone completely. Also, by refusing to meet, you're not taking into consideration that thousands of schools of Menhaden uh, are being caught just as they try and migrate into Maryland. So I agree completely that you should have a Menhaden board meeting this spring to consider uh, these very important topics. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mr. Zip. Um, and yes, uh, your, your voices are heard. Um, we are um, planning on having a, a meeting this spring. There's a lot to cover and a lot of uh, good updates, uh, I think, for what is going on with our, our Menhaden research and monitoring. And, um, and I appreciate uh, both of you keeping that within the time frames. I, I think we have at least one other hand, two two hands still. So I'll go to George Stoker. Okay. For some reason, it's brave my won't speak. It's holding on one second now. Um, but I'm not hearing anything. George, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Sorry. Am I up? You're on, George. Did you want to make public comment? You had your hand raised. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was having technical issues, but I'm ready. Would you like to go? Ahead. Go ahead, George. Okay. Good morning, members of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. My name is George Skaka. I have a rich 35-year history as a publisher of a weekly fishing magazine in New York and a deep involvement in the fishing community including founding the first saltwater fishing website, leading a nationwide fishing network, serving as a founding president of the CCA New York and the recreational advisor on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Week Fish Advisory Board. Obviously, my connection to our marine environment is profound. Today, I'm here to discuss the significant environmental and economic impacts following the cessation of reduction menhaded fishing operations in New York. The Hudson bass fishery is thriving, a fact that clearly demonstrates when you look and compare the YOY data between the Hudson and Chesapeake stocks of striped bass since the end of the reduction fishing in our region. The transformation is nothing short of remarkable. Our striped bass fishery has evolved into a vibrant 
an extraordinary experience, providing a significant boost to anglers and the industry to support. Moreover, the overall marine ecosystem has experienced a significant revival. A prime example of this is the daily spectacle of breaching whales and dolphins off of Long Island's beaches, a site so frequent that beachgoers no longer need to board whale watching vessels to enjoy these majestic creatures. The consistent presence of bluefin tuna throughout the fishing season further indicates the thriving wildlife, underscoring the richness and robust health of our marine habitat. In addition, the resurgence in our bird populations, especially the presence of 14 pairs of nesting eagles are now on Long Island. It's a testament to the broader ecological recovery. These developments collectively illustrate a vibrant, rejuvenated marine and coastal ecosystem, a direct result of the positive changes in our fishing practices and environmental stewardship. In light of these positive changes, I strongly recommend that the Commission convenes an Atlantic Management Board meeting this spring. This meeting should focus on discussions and decision making regarding the future of Atlantic Manhattan reduction fishing particularly in the Chesapeake Bay. I apologize, but we, as I mentioned, I, we, uh, we have a very tight agenda today and that yeah, is two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I was told three minutes, I'm on to that, but all right. Thank you, thank you. Yes, no, I'm sorry, it was, it, it's two per individual. We are um, a, a bit behind on our agenda. And I think you have clearly uh, expressed your concerns and I appreciate that, thank you. We have one more member of the public that wishes to speak, and that's Steve Atkinson. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? We can, Steve. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Steve Atkinson. I'm president of the Virginia Saltwater Sport Fishing Association. I agree with the comments that have just been made about Menhaden as it relates to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, as you know, when we raise these concerns, we are often told there is no science. So this this summer a team got together and developed a plan. Uh, and this included a plan for research, basically, it included representatives from the industry. Uh, this resulted in uh, a bill that's now pending before the General Assembly. And I'm sad to say that the industry is now lobbying against this bill. And I, I just find this to be a, a stunning disregard for the Chesapeake Bay. That's all. Thank you. All right, well, I appreciate all the comments. And as I mentioned, um, looking forward to um, a Menhaden meeting in this at the spring. Um, and a lot of updates will be provided. With that, we'll move into the executive committee report. I'm very appreciative of the fantastic summary provided by staff. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we met yesterday uh, and uh, got a kickoff from Alexander Law on staff um, who reported on uh, legislative happenings for us, including um, what is going on with the legislative committee. Uh, he spoke also about the um, uncertainty in, in the federal fiscal budget, uh, which has been going on for some time, obviously. Uh, there are also s some interest in trying to resurrect the reintroduction for um, reauthorization for Magnuson. So we will see where that goes. Uh, one of the big issues for all of us trying to manage uh, these fisheries resources is the continuing budget issues. Uh, and we know that even that static funding um, year after year, that obviously results in some serious cuts. Uh, so that's one of our biggest pushes uh, at the commission to drill at home at Congress, how important that is to uh, keep the lights on here. Uh, we got a report from Janita Patel, who is our science committee coordinator on the um on the cess which is our um sorry our uh uh, uh 
Economic um, and Social Science Committee. Uh, so this is kind of a revitalization for this committee. We have a, a new chair, Sabrina Lovell, and a new vice chair, Andrew Schell. Uh, we had put out a request to all commissioners just for some ideas on what the CES should be working on. And we went through a summary of that. I, I have been referring to that as kind of a first blush on what, what they will be working on for us. So I think really the importance is that we now have a group that's working on stuff not only for the commission, but is interested in ta tackling this at a state by state level. Uh, so we really appreciate their help. And um, for any commissioners here who are still thinking about stuff that might have missed that deadline, um, we, we would be happy to hear of other interests that they feel the states need. Uh, quickly, we went through the election procedures for commission chair and vice chair. Uh, we go on a, we have been traditionally going on a, a rotation of um, mid-Atlantic, New England and, and South Atlantic. Um, one of the interesting things is it's also traditional to have a, a, a two-year term for chair and vice chair. Uh, however, elections are required more or less on an annual basis. So, um, brings us to, sorry, folks, our strategic plan. So we're starting again at a, at a new strategic plan for 2024 through 2028. We had a preview of that at our annual meeting last year. Um, I think most, most commissioners felt that that was looking pretty solid. We did, a, we did some edits to that, thanks especially to Erica and to staff for putting together that strategic plan and uh, was approved. Uh, well, excuse me. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go through that approval at the business session, but XCOM had no further edits there. And we, we briefly discussed um, the idea of um, keeping four meetings in person for the commission, or should I say at least uh, this hybrid procedure. Uh, and, and the reason why we brought that up was it was a discussion that started while we were still forced to be virtual during the pandemic. And I think there was a strong general consensus among XCOM that things are going pretty well. There are really good reasons to stay in person, but always have this virtual option for both commissioners and the public. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then one other thing that uh, we talked about in XCOM was uh, staff will be putting together a letter that will come back before this board um, uh, on what's happening with the federal disaster relief. There's some current legislation and we're looking for some clarity uh, between what Congress was expecting to happen and and the current procedures with NOAA. So uh, staff will be putting that together and we'll see a draft of that. Is that for the next meeting, Bob? Or... Yes, okay, so for by the next meeting, we'll see a draft of that. So that, that covers our XCOM report. Okay, and we're gonna turn it over to Alexander to go through our survey results. Letters first, sorry. Okay. Uh, the XCOM uh, recommended that the policy board uh, approve a letter of support for a working waterfronts protection program. Um, there are two bills in front of Congress right now, one in the Senate, one in the House, uh, that would both address creating a working waterfronts protection program. Uh, they differ in uh, different provisions, how they approach this. Um, so the letter that I drafted is high level and um, just speaks to the need and the impact that uh, our, our states are seeing uh, when it comes to working waterfront uh, conversion threats or climate change.
Thank you, Alexander. So again, this is coming out of executive committee and I'm just looking for uh, a show of support here at the policy board to move this letter forward. So if I can get uh, some acknowledgement or consensus or let's do it this way. Is there is there any objection to putting this letter forward? Not seeing it. Okay. Thank you. Um, and yes, Alexander, I appreciate uh, you being here up here with us. I did forget to go to David, so let's do that now if we can. Go ahead, David. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, inserting me in the in the uh, process early because I've got to catch a plane. Uh, the only issue I want to talk about, and it's going to be very brief, is if the uh, last um, board meeting I raised the subject of catch and release mortality on striped bass, and and it's well well reflected in the minutes uh, the concerns. But to summarize, the concern is that we don't we don't currently have a process uh, to examine that that issue. And I'm getting increasingly concerned about uh, the lack of that that effort on on that particular issue because 40 percent of the mortality on striped bass relates to catch and release. And when you combine that with the news that we seem to get at every single meeting about poor year classes here, poor year classes there, invasive species uh, feeding on striped bass and in the estuaries and so forth. I think we're getting into a really dangerous place where we have very limited uh, management measures to address some of those types of concerns. So my suggestion at the last board meeting was basically we asked the uh, chair of the board uh, to focus some attention on that and kind of bifurcate the, that issue of catch and release mortality in the components that, that, that the board could deal with and figure out a process to deal with that issue and then uh, report, report that, um, uh, for instance, at the May meeting. Tony had offered some staff assistance in doing that. I think she's still willing to do that, but I think it would help here to have uh, some in, input on this issue just quickly from the current board chair because she's thought about it um, and then we can move on with it. If, if people feel comfortable that this is a serious issue we need to work on, then, then I think we can leave it to the discretion of the current board chair to work on it and draw in relevant expertise to help her out. Thank you. No, thank you, David. I, I, I think we all realize, uh, we, we share your concerns and um, we realize that, you know, this this issue kind of got decoupled from previous actions. Um, we weren't able to figure out a, a way forward through previous agenda and, <laughs> and amendments. So it's, you know, we're at a point where I think we we have to be as proactive as possible to work on this. So I would like to bring Megan up, but do you have another comment, David? And just quickly add, this is a really complex issue to deal with, and it's probably gonna uh, need to involve a diversity of expertise to deal with it. And there's a lot of uncertainty with the issue. And uh, my rule of thumb when you get into a situation like this is you lean into the un uncertainty and try to work through the uncertainty. So I, uh, hopefully Megan has the, the way forward on this. <laughs> well, there's the weight of the world on your shoulders. So I'm um, going to turn to Megan where our current board chair for No sure. pressure, Megan. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, David mentioned that he had brought this up at our previous board meeting. Obviously, we were pre-focused on addendum two yesterday. So um, in talking with Emily, some thoughts we've had are over the next you know, few weeks or months, uh, we're going to compile some of the documentation we've had in terms of um, discussions on discord mortality, what the challenges are, you know, some of the thoughts from the law enforcement committee, the technical committee. So that's all in one place and then potentially getting together a work group or a group of commissioners to start a conversation on discard mortality. I, I don't know how much progress we would make on that work group ahead of the main meeting, 
Um, but that would be a potential vision forward. I think we have some space time between now and the annual meeting when we get the assessment to start to think about this. And we've also been in contact with MassDMF to potentially present some of their um, studies on discard mortality that they've been working on at the May meeting. So that's something else we've been thinking about. Yeah, thanks, Megan. I, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think our goal really uh, is being prepared for the next assessment more so than uh, than an upcoming meeting. I, I know we do have a tight schedule, but this is a very important issue to a lot of us. So I will look around the table to see if there are any other comments on this or, you know, otherwise we will proceed and do our best to be ready, as I said, for action, knowing that the next assessment may not be so pleasant. All right, well, that I think we now can turn it back over to Alexander. Thank you. Good deal, thank you. I'm gonna be brief here uh, because of how quickly I'm going through things. I encourage you guys to look over the, uh, the answers to the open-ended questions included in the 2023 chair or commissioner survey results. Um, basically for every one commissioner saying uh, one concern, there's a commissioner concerned about the exact opposite thing. So it really shows the diversity of uh, opinions here and um, the questions, the ranked questions one through 16 um, are not particularly uh, interesting. There, there hasn't been a large change from year to year in the past few years. Um, and there's nothing to be concerned about there in terms of our direction. Um, the, like in previous years, uh, cooperation with federal partners, particularly the councils, uh, is our lowest scoring question. Um, I believe last year people expressed that uh, they would like the councils to meet us in the middle more and come to more of our meetings. Um, effective utilization and availability, availability of commission resources has consistently scored as our highest question. Um, and the open-ended question responses have expressed thanks for staff, um, knowledge and responsiveness. Um, the open-ended answers to questions 17 through 20 provide some unique insights. So again, I encourage you guys to look over those in your own time. Um, many commissioners have expressed climate change as our biggest obstacle. One commissioner talked about the need to revisit rebuilding programs and gave Southern New England Lobster as an example. A few mentioned not putting long-term stock health before political pressure and interests within, within each state, influencing our management decisions. Uh, others expressed uh, concern about reliable data, uh, especially facing increased uncertainty due to climate change. Uh, one of the interesting responses that was expressed in question 19, a couple people mentioned this, uh, was the need for, to create products for an audience that doesn't seek out engagement with our management process and aren't necessarily trained fishery biologists. So potentially creating different products for different audiences um, with a reduction in the usage of complicated acronyms or uh, fishery management terms, which may be a barrier to entry for some people. Um, a couple of people also asked for more frequent stock updates. Um, and that is about what I'm gonna give you for now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alexander, that was, um, you know, we had some discussions about uh, the survey uh, with, Bob and, and Dan and I, and uh, we, we certainly still see value in this. I hope you all do as well. Uh, are there any uh, questions or comments for us on this? Go ahead, Ray. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, being how we're gonna move forward with hybrid meetings, I had to talk to a constituent last night from my state, and in the future, if as we go around the table and motions are made, we all know who we're, we're talking to at the table, but people on the webinars, they say, well, who made the motion? Well, Mike Luisi made the motion. Well, they don't know who Mike Luisi is. So 
when you present or you want to make a motion, I'm Ray Kane from Massachusetts. Uh, so people on the webinar know who made the motion. Just a thought. Thank you. Ray, so um, people, you want people to say what state they're from because it does say on the webinar screen what who has made the motion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. State. Just just clarifying, and I I think if we every time someone speaks, they say what state they're from. I think that'll add to the length of the meeting. So maybe when people are making motions, they try to do that. But I think if we said it every single time, that might get tricky. Lynn? How about, I mean, the list is there, but how about just a list with every webinar that lists the commissioners and where they're from, and then they can reference? It'd be easier. Yeah, Pat? Well, I think Tony touched on it, right? When the, when the motion goes up on the board and says who it is, you can put in parentheses the state they're from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those of you that remember our parliamentary training that, um, they were kind of adamantly opposed to the idea that names were even attached to motions, but we certainly see the importance of that. I think one of the most important things is to absolutely always have a motion on the board so that we all know what we're dealing with. And 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 even the you know I I always appreciate when we get clarity on the intention of that motion. But I don't see any reason, because we have all agreed to have names attached, to not also have uh, the state that's represented in, in those motions. I, but, you know, as we move forward, that's something that we can continue to discuss if there's any concerns there. Thanks, Ray. Any other comments on the on the survey? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony for a jurisdiction request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in your meeting materials, you have a letter from the state of New York. New York is request, requesting to declare into the Cobri, Cobia fishery. Um, and this request is consistent with the plan review team's recommendations, at least for the last year, if not the last two or three years to New York. Um, for the past five years, the occurrence of cobia in New York state waters has dramatically increased. Prior to 2019, New York rarely saw over 1,000 pounds, and then from 2019 to 2022, landings were over 1,000 pounds each, um, in some years reaching a high of uh, over 5,000 pounds. Their landings have been... Um, uh, at least 6.9, 2.6, and 2% of the coastwide commercial landings in 2020, 2021, and 2022, respectively. Their recreational encounters have also increased in recent years, um, and in 2020 and 2022, they were um, just shy of 3,000 pounds and just over 4,000 pounds, respectively. Um, and prior to 2020, the last recorded recreational cobia catch in New York had occurred in 1994. Um, we are also seeing in the literature that suitable habitat for cobia is moving northward. Um, and so based on the criteria in the commission's guiding documents, New York would meet the guidelines of being added into a species um, fishery, uh, but it is something that we need the board to consider here today. And I don't know if Marty has anything you wanted to add. No, thanks, Tony. You characterized it pretty well. Um, I may or may not have touched on it, but um, we are seeing them in our commercial landings too, all the, albeit at a very low level. Um, but this is another um, instance of a species that's moving. Um, and of course, we've seen them move from the south up into the Virginia Capes and now it's not uncommon for our fishermen to tell us they could actually target these fish. They get around pods of Menhaden. So uh, as Tony indicated, uh, we'd like to declare an interest with into this fishery. So uh, we'll, we'll do this through a motion, Marty, if you don't mind. And, and we'll have, we have something we can bring up for you. Thank you.
Marty, would you mind? Yep, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we like, I'd like to move to add New York as a state with a declared interest, interest, right? In the Cobia FMP, Inter, interstate. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll, we'll make that edit, and and we have a second by Ray Kane from Massachusetts. So there we are. Um, we have a a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion on this? Any concerns from the board? Any objections to this motion? No objections. Good. Okay. Motion passes by consent. Thank you. So we're going to move on. Uh, next agenda item is a discussion on aquaculture in the EEZ, and we have uh, Danielle Blacklock with us here uh, from NOAA Fisheries. Um, again, uh, I appreciate the presentation, Danielle, and um, due to timing, I think that we will do our best to allow some questions, um, but I Hopefully, you'll provide some contact information for folks to discuss this or, or continue this discussion with you at another time as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Blacklock. I'm the director of the Office of Aquaculture within the NOAA Fisheries Service. Can you go over to the next slide? I'm excited to be here with you today. Um, as many of you know, aquaculture is a great tool to be used for species conservation and habitat restoration, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm here to talk about the food aspect. See, I like food and I'm a little concerned that we don't have enough of it. We already import 70% of the seafood we eat. As we do that, we have to think about the fact that all countries aren't created equal when it comes to conservation laws and policies. So as we import our seafood, we export our impact. More than half of the seafood we're importing is farmed, just in other places. Global demand for seafood is rising. So in this busy marketplace, the competition is gonna get hot. We're expected to have a global seafood supply gap of 50 million tons in the next 25 years. And that's with Americans only eating 70% of what is recommended for nutrition. Americans are malnourished, and that's probably not something that you think about regularly. But with 42% of adults obese in this country and a higher percentage than that uh, pre-diabetic, at the same time, 12.8% of households are food insecure. We have both sides of the malnutrition coin to tackle, and seafood is a component of the solution for both. As a lean protein that's good for your mind and your heart, full of omega-3s, the more that we can produce locally to get into those homes at a price point they can afford, the better off we'll be. On to the next slide. And all of those challenges are before we talk about climate change, which I know all of you are living day to day as stocks shift, production changes. We have to figure out how to build a climate smart food system. On to the next. And we're not the only ones talking about seafood anymore. Aquaculture is a topic that is across the government right now. Uh, the administration last year released the Ocean Climate Action Plan. You may have heard of that. And one of the key actions for using the climate that using the ocean for climate resilience and adaptation is to expand US aquaculture production. They're, the White House is saying that aquaculture is a part of our climate solution set. Then that middle image there is NSM 16. If NSM is not part of your daily vernacular, that's National Security Memorandum. National Security Memorandum uh, 16, which is on the strengthening the security and resilience of U.S. food and agriculture, makes some big policy statements. 
it says aquaculture is agriculture. And then it goes further to say that agriculture is designated as critical infrastructure of this nation. So that means that our existing sea farmers are critical infrastructure. So not only are we looking to expand, but we also wanna make sure our existing farms are resilient. And then over to the right, a little bit of a creepy cover here, but this is the Department of Homeland Security. They put out a report on the threats to food and agricultural resources. In response to those threats, they have one of the six national priorities to build a domestic, uh, resilient domestic food system to expand domestic aquaculture production. My inbox has changed. The letters at the end of the email addresses have changed. I get a lot of, ma'am, I'd like to sit down with you and talk about the resilience of the US aquaculture sector from dot mill. Ma'am, I'd like to run a tabletop exercise about how we're gonna feed our country and I'd like you to be a part of it, dot HHS. This is a bigger conversation and I'm here, so that's the framing of why I'm here to talk to you today. On to the next. Why the policy board? You can click again, sorry. I didn't mean to make it animated. Striped bass. I know that you have had a busy meeting on striped bass and that yesterday was probably a hard day for many. And I'm hoping that our conversation today can be seen as part of the solution set to some of the challenges that are happening. On to the next. Why do I wanna talk about striped bass when it's a pretty hot species on the East Coast? because it's really versatile and we know how to do it. You can grow it in freshwater and saltwater. It has a large temperature range, as we know. <laughs> so it could be farmed up and down the East Coast. And it also has multiple culture methods. So it's currently, you can farm it in ponds on land, you can farm it in recirculating systems, freshwater or saltwater, as I mentioned, and in net pens out in the ocean. Also, we're interested because there's an existing market Creating a market is hard. And if there's an existing marketplace, even though in some states and some places it's a seasonal marketplace, what if we made that year round and created opportunity for what's also <laughs> wildly harvested in that new marketplace? And then the final point is really the key one for me in answering some of those dot mill emails is about equal opportunity. On to the next. What I mean by that is, as you guys know, um, it's illegal to fish, harvest, possess, or retain striped bass in the Atlantic EEZ. And then some states have a prohibition on sale. That doesn't affect the Gulf of Mexico. And we're actively receiving applications for Gulf of Mexico waters to farm Atlantic striped bass. Not hybrid striped bass, Atlantic striped bass. On to the next. And it's already happening. I mentioned that. Um, right now, there are there's pond farms in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Texas. Ohio is trying recirculating aquaculture that has been successful in research, now trying it commercially. And there are net pens in Mexico. I don't know if you all have heard of the company Pacifico. They just made an announcement last month that they are building the first Atlantic striped bass commercial hatchery. They expect to put 20,000 metric tons into our marketplace through this hatchery. It's already in my Whole Foods and Wegmans, straight from Mexico. It's our technology. The US figured it all out and we've exported technology and now we're importing fish. In addition, farmed Atlantic striped bass is commanding a premium price um, compared to wild harvested and farmed hybrid striped bass. Next slide. This is my last slide. Um, We've been researching it for a long time. It started in 1978, excuse me, 1874. I'm not gonna give the whole history, but there's been dramatic improvements in our knowledge base. And that's why you're now seeing the commercial growth. We've sort of gone on the other side of the tipping point of it being economically and biologically viable. Dramatic improvement in growth rates due to selective breeding. This current generation is growing faster than hybrid striped bass and it gets a premium price point, so of course people are interested. The full genome is sequenced, which opens up the ability to do further selective breeding and selection. 
multiple known sterilization methods. So should farms go in our waters, we have techniques to make sure that they can't reproduce with wild populations. There are known feeding protocols all the way through the life cycle. And there's an investment in a consortium of research called Striper Hub. The National Sea Grant Program has invested in this collaboration and consortium of researchers. And the goal of that effort is commercialization of both striped bass and hybrid striped bass. So the research is happening, the farming is happening. What we have is an imbalance in what is accessible to interested farmers. In the Gulf of Mexico, in the US, they can go in with applications, et cetera, et cetera, that are then thoroughly reviewed, of course. In um, the Atlantic coast, there's not a legal pathway currently to do so. Now, I'm not sure whether that is on purpose or not. I don't know that when those rules were made, people were really thinking about farming Atlantic striped bass because the science wasn't there. And now it is. What I'd like to know is how I and my team can be helpful in building an understanding of where the science is and what policy implications that might have. I'm not a striped bass expert, and I can't sit here and answer quizzical questions about, well, what's the status of this on striped bass? But I can get back to you. If there are specific things that you're interested in learning more about, I'm happy to put my team to work and the suite of researchers that have built this industry that has been exported abroad. So with that, I, uh, I take any questions. I know you're short on time. Um, and I hope to hear from you all. My email address is my first name dot last name at noah.gov, like everyone else's. Um, I'm sorry, it's not on the slide, but I'm happy to have a conversation separate from this too. Well, thank you very much. And, and I, I, I appreciate that. And, and I've been so foreboding on our time constraints, <laughs> and yet we are actually doing pretty well. So this is a very interesting topic for sure. Uh, one of the struggles for all of us here, I think, especially with the introduction of offshore wind, are uh, competing uses in our oceans. Um, so I, I, I know that's one topic of importance to all of us. And, and obviously, striped bass is near and dear to many of us. Um, and the poster child for the commission. So I'm going to open it up to the board for any questions or comments for, for Noah on this. Uh, I'll go to Roy and John, it looks like maybe you as well. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, Daniel, for the presentation. I, I've been around long enough on this commission to remember when we had some policies concerning striped bass stocking that, that were generated in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and particularly in regard to aquaculture products. Uh, we took a stance in those days, no active stocking of hybrid striped bass, for instance, uh, for fear of, of damage to the uh, genetic um, authenticity of, of wild stocks. Um, we were also concerned at the time about escapees from aquaculture, particularly when aquaculture was conducted in a coastal zone area, uh, let alone net pens, that that technology pretty much wasn't considered actively in the late 1980s. But obviously net pens present a real challenge, particularly when they're stationed offshore. Uh, the chance of storm events and escapement is high. Um, and then striped bass that are aquaculture products um, with, let's say, limited genetic diversification would be loosed upon the environment and mixing with natural stocks. So there are those concerns, and we, we did consider them important enough in the late 80s and early 90s that we took, as a commission, we took some positions on it. So I, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Uh, we'll go to John and then Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Danielle. Um, you mentioned that this is already going on in Mexico, and 
uh, as you mentioned, so many of these aquaculture techniques have been developed here, but then they've moved to developing countries where the cost of production is so much less. And I'm guessing with the water temperatures, they probably grow faster there too. Um, what are the economics of raising them, even in the in the Gulf, as you mentioned? What type of price point would they need to make this viable? That's fine, right? Yes, sorry. Um, I think that we could do more analyses on that. What we're hearing is that by the price they're fetching now, which I would have to look down, actually I have it in my notes, um, fetching a price higher than hybrid striped bass has made it now economically viable because they're growing faster. They're growing to market size in less than two years, which my understanding is that between the price point they're getting now, which I think is just over $5, um, per pound, although when you buy it from farm, it's like retail, it's closer to 15 to 17, um, and how fast they're growing, that it is now economically viable. Um, some studies have been done, but until we have a test case in the water, we don't know for sure. Thank you. I'm going to go to Pat Kelleher and then Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Daniel, good to see you again. Thanks for the presentation. Um, this is the second time you've been before us and brought up uh, the EEZ-related issues. Um, if, if I recall correctly, EEZ-related issues are for striped bass pertains to really on the recreational side, not of being allowed to fish for or possess striped bass in EEZ. But isn't that something that, that NOAA could simply um, change the rule for an exemption uh, for aquaculture for possession of farm-raised aquaculture. I'm not sure you. I'm not sure if you're coming to us because you you have an ask of that, and you want to want that to come from the from the commission. Um, that that's my first question. And my staff has also indicated that that your folks, you and your folks, might be developing a white paper uh, around striped bass. And if that is the case, is that something you could? Uh, provide um, uh, the policy board or the strike mass board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we certainly could produce a white paper if that's of interest. I think that with aquaculture, um, it's important to not be too heavy handed. We want to create opportunity and access without creating um, undo uh, fear. And I, I think that taking a measured approach is really important. Um, and starting with a white paper or something like that and continuing the conversation with the commission is something that, in my perspective, is the right path. Follow up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the comment on not being too heavy handed because this is one issue as far as uh, expanding other activities into the EZ are going to displace uh, existing users. They're going to potentially have flora and fauna impacts. So this navigation impacts are all the criteria that we have to use in Maine when we're dealing with any aquaculture and, and they're highlighted with finfish aquaculture. So finfish aquaculture has become a lightning rod, whether it's in the water or now even on shore. So. Uh, I appreciate the, the the sentiment that you don't want to be heavy-handed and and take a more measured approach. Um, and I think it's I think from a commission standpoint, it's probably worth having more additional conversations around this to understand where this is going. Um, there certainly could be some benefits with this type of approach, but the the um, the potential opposition is 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 real associated with uh, with this type type of growth. So thank you. Thanks, Pat. We're going to go to Lynn, then Dan, and then Eric online. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Danielle, for your, your presentation. Um, I, I have a lot of questions. I love the idea of a white paper, and my two questions, one centers around, um, you know, enforcement. We have people in our state who have gone to jail for, um, you know, malfeasance with striped bass 
tagged. So you imagine we have this population of striped bass um, under our different enforcement. I, I would actually appreciate a little exploration into, into how that might work. And the other one is economics. Also in my state, we, you know, in the last two decades, we've legalized, rewritten our laws to allow for oyster aquaculture. It's a burgeoning business in the state of Maryland. It's a wonderful thing, but it unleashed a lot of pretty ugly competition between the wild fishery and the um, aquaculture fishery. And I, you know, salmon, you see it in the market, you see this is aquaculture salmon raised in Chile or it's wild caught salmon from Alaska. But, you know, you say that the market is, is established for striped bass, but I think that's primarily a wild caught market. So I know that I would certainly get questions from uh, fishermen in my state. We are the largest commercial fishery for striped bass, how this is going to impact their markets. And I would, I would actually be a little bit interested in the, in the economics of that. If you're putting together a white paper, um, I'd love to see some thoughts on that. And thank you. Thanks, Lynn. I'll go to Dan. A friend of mine in college once said, you'll learn something new every semester. And one of the nuggets that I'm taking home after this meeting is the fact that the eel aquaculture in Maine is exceeding the United States you know, wild harvest. So if there's any parallels to this, the striped bass in the Chesapeake appear to be failing, at least for the last five years. So I think in some ways <clears throat> there's an inevitability uh, and certainly a, a market that is uh, potential uh, to be developed here. I think where this takes place is probably the most controversial, uh, whether it be you know right over the, the a state waters line, the EEZ, and the potential for escapement. But one of the things, Danielle, that you raised was state regulations that ban sale. And if I'm curious about that, and I'm wondering if, as an ASMFC uh, initiative um, staff, could uh, poll the states about their rules pertaining to uh, aquaculture products and non-conforming uh, fish because, um, you know, I know that when New Hampshire had their cod and halibut uh, aquaculture, you know, we did everything we could to help get those products into the market, even though they were going to be undersized. And I think that we just need to modernize some of our regulations um, as some of these products uh, become farm raised. So I guess I would ask Tony or Bob if if this is something that uh, we could look at among the states to, to study the, um, the degree that states accommodate non-conforming uh, fish or shellfish um, that are farm raised, because I, I think that's sort of like next chapter here in terms of uh, allowing aquaculture to develop alongside wild fisheries. Thanks, Dan. I'm gonna go to Eric Reed online. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, as, as far as um, you know, things that are prohibited in the EEZ, Atlantic salmon possession is prohibited in the EEZ as well, and it's also prohibited for federally permitted vessels no matter where they are. So I would suggest uh, anybody of interest would look at New England's action to accommodate salmon farming in the EEZ about how we handled some of those. But my question is about uh, competing interests or space in the ocean. Uh, aquaculture is competing, a competing interest. And offshore wind, uh, the lease areas, those are competing interests for space as well. And those areas have the ability to do certain things other than offshore wind. So my question is, who would regulate placement of aquaculture facilities within those areas? I think that I can answer your question about who regulates space. Um, for finfish aquaculture, which we're talking about, the, the permitting authorities are the Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, and then NOAA plays a consultative role for endangered species, um, habitat, et cetera, et cetera. The siting warehouse that finds farms space is inside of NOAA. It's in the Ocean Service. There are 30 scientists at the ready that help place um, identify appropriate sites. So the science is in NOAA, but the authority that 
permits the use of that space is the Army Corps of Engineers. And then the permitting agency for effluent and environmental impacts to water quality is EPA. Hopefully that was clear enough. Follow up? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I appreciate that, and I hope you're right. But in, in reality, the offshore wind lease areas are managed by BOEM. And it's my experience that NOAA and everybody else is only an advisory, in their, an advisory capacity that may or may not be adhered to. So I, I'd like to find out for real what BOEM allows the offshore wind areas to do other than offshore wind. They're all foreign companies and they know a lot about farming, a lot of things. So I, I just, I'm, I'm, I, you don't need, I don't need to know today, but I think it's something that we should address. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, just a clarification. I think I misunderstood originally. Are you talking about co-location with wind specifically? It's exactly what I'm talking about. Got it. Okay, thank you. I took a note. Okay, thanks. I'm going to go to Erica and then Dave Sikorsky online. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I'm in Florida and we're paying attention to NOAA's development of the aquaculture opportunity areas. Um, I'm very interested in seeing a white paper on this and was wondering if we could also receive a copy of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And, and to Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this is an important conversation. I appreciate being able to participate. And um, I'd like to you know, thank Ms. Fagley for her comments from a Chesapeake perspective, for sure. And um, highlight something that hasn't been raised um, today, and that's um, the forage needs of aquaculture fish and how we have some various challenges that have already been raised in this committee today by some stakeholders and um, continues to be a challenge. Um, from a national security standpoint, exports, lots of different things, ecosystem balance, et cetera. So I think that's really important to consider. You know, what are these fish being fed? Where are those sources from? And we got to be really cognizant of robbing Peter to pay Paul, especially with the challenges that our commercial fisheries already face and working waterfronts already face from so many angles. Um, and I know that we will all be keep that front of mind as we move forward with this. And um, just from a food resiliency program, our, our perspective, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the tremendous opportunity for wild caught protein here in the Chesapeake Bay with the invasive blue catfish. Uh, many of us in this region have for years been bumping into the hurdles and the roadblocks and the challenges that exist. And um, as was said earlier, markets are hard to develop, um, but there's low hanging fruit. And of course there's some policy constraints that um, many in this region are concerned about. And um, I think it's a all hands on deck effort if we really truly um, care about our domestic seafood sources, especially those that come from the Chesapeake Bay and, and then fuel the coast, which of course we all are organized to manage. So um, I really look forward to the white paper and, uh, and future conversations on this. And obviously nothing happens in a vacuum. So thank you for uh, bringing this to our attention today. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, and I'm, <clears throat> if, I, if I may, I see Cherie's hand is up, but I'm going to, um, editorialize here a bit myself. I'm always very skeptical by the numbers of imports when we don't talk about the numbers of exports as well. I, you know, I think if we remove the very cheaply raised um, shrimp and catfish that Americans are willing to pay for and look at, you know, all of the exports from the fish that we do our absolute best to manage here and as wild harvest, uh, that are being exported as as well as salmon that are caught here and then re <laughs> re imported um, I really do wonder about those numbers and those deficits of of uh, what we have available to us uh, i I also worry about um, you know competition we we've made some very tough choices just this week on keeping the spiny dogfish fishery alive here on even with our great concerns for straight bass, we, we, we made a very difficult decision on where the commercial fishery should be and taking a, a reduction, but doing our absolute, you know, empathic best to keep that fishery alive 
to, to have these discussions on a competition, which uh, our commissioner, Eric Reed, who's kind of our resident uh, fishmonger, Eric, if you'll allow me that, um, who called it a niche fishery. You know, I, I spent uh, quite a few years in the Chesapeake Bay and saw even in, you know, the first weeks of that wild harvest fishery opening, prices of wild harvest striped bass going from four dollars at four fifty a pound at the beginning of a week to two fifty a pound by the end of the week. So the thought of adding, you know, aquaculture fish to that, um, I have some concerns. I just want to put that out there and I'll uh, turn it over to Sheree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, New Hampshire has had to uh, deal with some agriculture, offshore agriculture um, permits or inquiries. And the thing that um, I continue to be concerned about with agriculture, apart from what we've heard so far, is oftentimes these permits or these inquiries don't necessarily include the complete project. And what I mean by a complete project has to do with land base infrastructure in shoreside facilities. You did hear a little bit um, on the shoreside facility aspect. Because without those sort of components to an aquaculture facility, it can't, um, it really can't be assessed appropriately. So I find it very important that not just NOAA fisheries, but also, and I've expressed that this to the Army Corps, that a complete application needs to be provided for public comment during the process. Thank you. Thank you, Sheree. I don't. Any other hands around the table? I don't see any online either. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate the presentation and uh, appreciate you providing that information. I'm sure you'll get some follow-ups from, from folks here and, and others listening online as well. Go ahead. If there's any other information that folks, folks think of later on, um, if you email me, I can pass that information along to Daniel. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we're gonna move on to a review from NOAA Fisheries on a white paper. Uh, those of you on the, or that follow the Mid-Atlantic and New England councils, uh, you'll be familiar with this. This white paper is on an industry-based survey and we're gonna turn it over to Catherine Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just confirming that you can hear me. We can, Catherine. Great. Thank you, Tony. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Catherine Ford. I'm the Population Ecosystem Monitoring and Analysis Director at Division Director at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Um, we call this Division PMAD, and it includes our Ecosystem Surveys Branch, which is run by Peter Chase. That branch is responsible for several major fishery independent surveys at the Northeast Fishery Science Center, including the multi-species bottom trawl survey, which will be the focus of the talk today. So today I'm talking about an industry-based trawl survey white paper that we wrote this fall. This work, I only put my name on the slide. There really wasn't enough room for everybody's names on here because so many people helped with this project but most notably the Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel and a work group that that panel set up um, helped with this project. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with NTAP, it's a joint Mid-Atlantic and New England Council advisory panel. Next slide. So I'm here today to present the white paper that was developed in response to the Council and Commission motions from September and October of 2023 to develop a white paper outlining an industry-based survey that is complementary to the spring and autumn bottom trawl survey that the Science Center runs. Next slide. The Northeast Fisheries Science Center's multi-species bottom trawl survey, which I'll generally refer to as the BTS or the bottom trawl survey, 
um, is operated by the Science Center. And the purpose of this survey is to monitor ecosystem changes and trends in abundance, distribution, and life history for demersal fish. We provide information for 63 stocks and we collect more than 600 species on this survey. It's a shelf scale survey that extends from Cape Lookout to Nova Scotia. The reason that we sample in Canadian waters is because this survey predates the Hague line. The key uh, reports that we inform with this data include the status of ecosystem reports, stock assessments, and climate assessments. This data is used much more broadly than just the reporting requirements in the Northeast Fishery Science Center, um, and it's a substantial scientific undertaking that is globally recognized. We sample 60 days in the fall and 60 days in the spring for a total of 120 survey days per year. We use as our primary platform, the Bigelow. The Bigelow also has a sister ship called the Pisces. And both of these ships are run by the NOAA line office OMAO or Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. Uh, we're in NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. OMAO is a separate line agency uh, within NOAA. NOAA. Uh, NOAA OMAO also ran uh, the predecessor vessel to the Bigelow, the Albatross 4, which operated this survey until 2008. And we did an extensive calibration between the two vessels, as well as new gear that was used by the Bigelow um, before the Bigelow started in 2009. The trawl survey gear that's used was designed with the Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel, and similar gear is used by the Southern New England Mid Atlantic NEMAP survey that's done by VIMS. Um, as well as chess map and other regions are thinking of using this gear. We, um, this program includes five biologists and three gear technicians for a total of eight full-time staff that focus on making sure that this survey is conducted each year, each season, two seasons a year. Um, when we're out on the boat, we're sailing with 16, or sorry, 15 scientific staff. And the survey staff that are the full-time staff also support a variety of research efforts, including taxonomic studies, restratification analyses, catch efficiency research, and a variety of modernization projects. This is an extremely valuable survey for both fisheries and marine ecosystem monitoring. And a key goal in how we operate this survey is to provide consistency in our trawl performance. Next slide. The reason why consistency is so important is to um, make sure we don't introduce uncertainty in what um, our scientific results are. So we have protocols for the survey to be as consistent as we can to compare our catch results year over year. We don't want to uh, blame a gear change for a change in the catch, for example. So the images on the left here show an example of inconsistent trawl performance. You can see that top image shows the trawl net right on the seafloor and then the bottom image shows the trawl a little bit off the seafloor um, so that can result in different results and the way we handle that is we use a tow evaluation program and a variety of protocols to ensure that there's consistency any toes that exceed our standards will be re-towed on the right hand side i'm showing an example of inconsistency in the time series Inconsistency in the time series, you can see a gap between the orange line on the left and the green line on the right. This is just a, a theoretical data set of humidity. This is just a random time series, not, not anything to do with fisheries, but you can see that gap in between um, the two time periods. And to fill that gap, you can use a variety of tools to extrapolate over that gap. But when you do that kind of work, you introduce uncertainty. This isn't always a big problem, very data rich uh, environments. We have excellent capabilities for creating extrapolations, um, but it can be especially in more data poor situations. We do have a lot of tools to try and address any lack of consistency that we have. We use things like calibrations and catch efficiency studies. Um, there are modeling advances that we're using. Uh, you can even start a new time series and have a, a brand new data set uh, that could go into uh, understanding a particular um, question. But all of these types of uh, 
activities to address inconsistency represent various trade-offs, either in precision or accuracy of the data, could, could involve uh, um, slowing down the timeline of the analyses and the availability of the data, the complexity of the analyses. So in general, the less data massaging that you have to do after collecting a data set, the better. You really wanna uh, make sure that you're as consistent as possible in these long time series. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that can affect gear performance, especially for trawl surveys, is the platform itself. So the way um, we've been doing this for 60 years is to rely on a single vessel and be as consistent as we can with um, the vessel itself, as well as all of the trawl protocols that we use. In recent years, we've become concerned about the reliability of the Bigelow vessel. So this graph here shows our spring survey in the solid line and our fall survey in the dotted line. And the first half of the survey years, 2009 to about 2015, and we had very good survey performance. A, a good survey year for us, we target about 370 stations. We typically accomplish around 350 stations. Um, and so you see that we have very stable performance um, up until about 2017. In 2017, there was a mechanical failure. The P Pisces, the sister ship was brought in to complete the survey. You can also see the clear impact of the COVID year in 2020. We actually got out in the spring and March um, of 2020, but then we were brought, out, brought in off the water um, once COVID really got going. And then in the fall, we were off the water for the whole season. And then last spring, um, spring of 2023, uh, there were mechanical um, issues, a uh, variety of issues with the vessel and it got stuck in dry dock for a couple of months. So over the history of the Bigelow time series, we've done 30 surveys and 30% of them have less than 320 stations. And it does look like we're seeing um, less uh, reliable performance in the more recent years. Next slide. We're expecting more uh, platform impacts. So we have the unintended loss sea days that we've been um, addressing. There's also increasing challenges potentially with government shutdowns uh, that could occur really now at any time of the year, it seems like. We also have offshore wind that we're facing. The Bigelow vessel will not be able to op operate the trawl gear inside of offshore wind energy areas. There's a midlife refit that's coming up in September of 2027. We're in the process right now of making sure that the Pisces will be available during that time frame. Um, but we'll be down to that single vessel um, during that time frame. And then ultimately we're gonna have end of life in another uh, 20 or 30 years for the Bigelow. Next slide. So uh, especially after last spring's uh, loss of two months of sampling, uh, NTAP formed a working group to develop a contingency plan for the Bigelow. This work, working group kicked off on in September of 2023, and the term of reference is to describe vessel platforms that can support completing the Northeast Fishery Science Center's spring and fall bottom trawl survey when the Bigelow is unavailable. Next slide. There are four major options that we're looking at right now. The first is the Pisces. The second is a Northeast Fishery Science Center vessel that's calibrated to the Bigelow. Right now, the Science Center operates the Gloria Michelle vessel, and we're interested in um, procuring a larger vessel that could do further work further offshore and, and tow um, the gear that we tow on the Bigelow. The third option is an industry-based vessel calibrated to the Bigelow, and the fourth option is an industry-based survey that's not calibrated to the Bigelow. This would be a parallel separate time series entirely. Next slide. And that is the option that the motion addresses is this fourth option under this contingency plan that we're building. Next slide. The um, goals for this project span three major thematic areas. The first is 
providing science for management. Here we want to improve our data products by improving our survey data consistency. For operations, I'm referring to our survey operations, the activities that we take to create this data. Our main goal under our survey operations is to be consistent. And so we wanna add resilience here to the existing multi-species bottom trawl survey so we can continue to sample each season um, the, the maximum number of stations to get into that 350 station range. And then a third thematic area is industry involvement. Uh, we think it's critical for our science to be informed by industry's perspective. We wanna make sure that we're being fully transparent about the activities that we're undertaking. And a goal is to improve trust through collaboration. Next slide. So in building the industry-based survey white paper, the IBS white paper, um, we started back in September after the, um, we actually st started, um, we had an outline together prior to the uh, motions that the, the councils and the commission addressed. Um, and in the last several months, we've had um, two drafts that were um, reviewed. The first draft was reviewed internally and by the North, Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel's working group. Then we had a second draft that was also re reviewed internally by the working group and by external reviewers that um, included representatives from NOAA headquarters. Our national survey coordinator took a look at this. We had reviewers from the Northwest Fishery Science Center and the Alaska Fishery Science Center uh, that both run industry-based trawl surveys on the West Coast. Um, and we had uh, input from several other, uh, several other folks that are uh, associated with this project and very interested in this project. We also held three separate meetings. Two of them were with the um, NTAP working group and one of them was with the Northeast Fishery Science Center's Population Dynamics Branch that conducts our assessment work. Next slide. So what we have described in this white paper is to use the same design as the bottom trawl survey. We would use the same geographic range, season, strata, and station allocation as we currently use. We would aim for 24 hour sampling and determine if 12 hour per vessel is feasible. Um, this is a really important determination. Uh, we do sample 24 hours right now and we do have species that exhibit various diurnal patterns. Uh, so we're, we've explored how we would do 12 hour surveys um, that would span the dawn and dusk periods. Um, so this is something that needs additional conversation and exploration for how to make that work and if we even need to make that work. Um, for gear, the plan is to use the same gear as the Science Center survey, but provide flexibility on doors. Um, again, really focusing on making sure that trawl performance is consistent. Um, we also allowed flexibility on no auto trawls uh, based on industry feedback. Uh, and we would include net mensuration for the tow evaluation for, for all of the gear packages. Sampling would include providing station data, water quality data, all of the gear performance and net spread data. For catch, we would sample total number, biomass, composition, age, sex, maturity, and stomach, stomach contents, at least preserving stomach contents if they can't be processed on the ship. And then um, we need to determine additional biological sampling of catch during the pilot survey, which I'll explain in just a second. Next slide. The vessels would need to be of an appropriate length and horsepower to sample in ocean, open ocean conditions and tow gear at three knots for 20 minutes. We would need sufficient winch capabilities for towing the standardized gear package across the survey area. We would need necessary deck space for processing stations and catch processing. We're planning capacity for CTD casts to 200 fathoms. We're considering placement of the CTD on the trawl net as they do in the Northwest Fishery Science Center. We would need appropriate vessel crew for the length of the sampling day, whether it be uh, 12 or 24 hours. Uh, space for one spare net at least. 
Uh, depending on the length of the legs, if we uh, do have vessels that are doing uh, longer legs, uh, more spare nets may be necessary. So more space would be needed for that kind of uh, survey. It would be capable of using the appropriate doors to maintain the net performance. And if 24 hour operations are being done, the appropriate number of bunks for the vessel and science crews would be necessary. Next slide. Data management is an important consideration uh, throughout this endeavor. Uh, we rely right now on electronic data collection and management, and we would plan on continuing that. Uh, the key element here is making sure that this data is available to stock assessments relatively quickly. Um, we try to get it to them as soon as we can and aim for four weeks after a su survey concludes, and we would try to um, match that performance with this survey as well. With program management, um, the way we sketched this out in this framework was as a third party operated survey. But there are other options that are described here. This is an important consideration in terms of uh, how the program gets built out. Um, so the way we started was with kind of a simpler conceptual program management plan, which is to pass any funding through to a third party and the third party would run the survey. This is similar to how the Southern New England Mid-Atlantic NEAMAP survey is done um, and the Gulf of Maine NEAMAP survey is done. It's the Maine, New Hampshire NEAMAP survey. Next slide. Some of the key differences between the industry-based survey and the bottom trawl survey that we're doing on the Bigelow is that the way we've described it now is that program management relies on a third party. So we didn't build it up as a separate survey team within the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. We, we did this pass-through method. Um, there would be potential use of multiple vessels. Um, some folks did say that there are large enough vessels on the Eastern Seaboard to do what the Bigelow does, um, but we're opening the door to the possibility of multiple vessels. Uh, potential use of different doors is a difference. Um, smaller wire diameter came up as a as a different potential difference. Uh, the bottom trawl survey uses a one inch wire and the fleet in this region typically has seven eighths inch wire. Um, it is possible that wire is provided to the survey uh, and we stick with the one inch, but um, we could also use the wire on the vessels um, that's already there, the seven eighths inch. Uh, no auto trawls was request, requested uh, in the design. Um, this is the way the Alaska Fishery Science Center does its survey right now. They don't rely on auto trawls. They rely on protocols to ensure um, wire out consistency, but they're trying to move away from that. They want to use auto trawls uh, because it improves uh, net consistency, the trawl performance. We cannot establish the specific towing protocols at this time um, because they're really dependent on the vessels and some other specifics of how the vessels are set up. So that would need to be determined during a pilot study. Um, also, there was a fair bit of back and forth about biological sampling. Um, the industry requested a minim minimum viable biological sampling protocol to optimize or maximize the number of vessels that might be able to conduct this type of survey. However, a lot of the scientists who are doing industry-based surveys really think that uh, full biological sampling can be accommodated uh, on industry vessels. So this is another area for exploration during a pilot study. Um, plankton sampling is also to be determined. The bottom trawl survey uh, does do bongo towing and it's to be determined if we could handle that on industry-based vessels and what the impact on timing would be for the, for the, um, for the survey itself. Uh, we simplified it by removing acoustic sampling that adds a fair bit of electronics and data processing, um, data storage and handling. Uh, so we took out the acoustic sampling for now um, and I alluded to the complexities of the 12 and 24 hour day accommodation. So that's something else that needs uh, further exploration. Next slide. 
So back to the primary goals that we're trying to meet, um, how does the IBS address these goals? In providing science for management, um, the key scientific value is increasing resilience of our primary time series for many assessments. So the operations goal uh, will be able to create a replacement in the event that the Bigelow can't survey. And with industry involvement, we're um, working with industry to provide significant input into the design and operations. Um, and it is possible that industry vessels could be used as platforms for this survey. Next slide. So our next steps are to finish the contingency plan. So we wanna flesh out those first three options of the contingency plan. Um, for review, option number one is uh, using Pisces as the, uh, that's the sister ship to the Bigelow. We wanna use Pisces as a backup. Um, it's not ready to trawl right now. It needs some um, improvements. And we wanna make sure that that happens as soon as possible. Um, and then options number two and three are looking at other vessel platforms that would be calibrated to the Bigelow um, in some manner. So we wanna flesh out those options and see what the pros and cons of each of those are. We also need to start to connect this with the offshore wind. Um, so with offshore wind, we have a few different projects underway right now looking at the uh, potential uh, for mitigating our survey impacts. The Bigelow will not be able to sample inside of wind farms. And we're looking right now, uh, evaluating what those impacts are gonna be, what species are most affected by that, um, and what are the um, options for replacing those stations. And then um, I'm thinking that we can plan out a pilot survey in the next six to nine months that could be on the water in FY 2025. Um, this might be giving some people that are on this call a little bit of a heart attack, <laughs> um, but I think it's possible uh, at least on a, a relatively small scale um, to be able to have a pilot on the water in another year and a half or so. Um, that is dependent on an awful lot of variables, but um, I think it's a reasonable goal to strive for. Uh, next slide. So that was it. Um, thank you all um, for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions if there is time, but certainly uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or, or want any additional information about what we're up to. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we are going to um, go ahead with questions for Catherine and then um, we can go into some discussion if we um, want to do anything following up. Uh, Shanna and, and then Jason. Thanks, Tony, um, and thank you, Catherine, for your presentation. I think this is a, a really important topic, um, and I'm, I'm glad to see some progress being made here um, and the options that are available on the table. Um, I have a few comments that I'll save for later when we get into comment time, um, but I did have some questions regarding the pilot survey and sort of what you're envisioning for that. It seems like you have, you know, four options on the table right now. Um, are you thinking that the 2025 pilot survey is just going to encompass one of those options or that you might be testing several during that time period? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the pilot survey would be mostly focused on either options three or four. Um, those, so option one is the Pisces, which is the sister ship. We, we don't need to test that. We have used the Pisces in the past as a fill-in for the Bigelow. Um, and so that won't need testing. Um, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is in the process of considering procuring a larger vessel. And we would need to determine whether or not we want to uh, calibrate that vessel to the um, to the Bigelow survey or not. So that would be an outstanding question. But really, what I'm thinking about for a pilot survey, and again, this is very early days in this uh, line of thinking, but it's um, somewhere in addressing either option three, which is another platform calibrated to the Bigelow or option four, which would be platforms not calibrated to the Bigelow. So they'd be a separate time series. And that option four, 
that we addressed in the white paper may be most consistent with how we're going to be mitigating offshore wind. So we really need to advance our progress on that conversation and start to think about what is the regional need to uh, do a multi-species bottom trawl survey inside of offshore wind farms. How would we design that survey? How would we conduct that survey? And how could that serve um, in any sort of uh, capacity as a backup for the Bigelow? Thank you. Any follow-up, Shanna? All right, Jason? Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, that was great. Um, really appreciated the presentation. So I, a couple of um, just quick questions for me uh, that I didn't see covered, but I, I'm thinking you guys probably at least talked about. Um, so one of the, and maybe I'll start by saying it, this is um, fantastic. I, I remember the first time this concept came up that I was aware of was under uh, Bill Carp, and then I remember talking to John Hare about it uh, as well as he kind of came into the leadership role um, over at Woods Hole. So it's great to see how this has um, kind of kept going and, and it's uh, really far along in its evolution at this point. Um, one of the ideas that came up in those discussions was this notion of efficiency and, and potential cost savings. Have you guys talked um, about that at all? Maybe you're not quite there yet and you need to hammer out the logistics a little more, but I'm just wondering if if this you know, idea of efficiency and cost savings has come up in, in the context of the IBS. Yes, um, that's a great question. And um, it has come up. One of the um, items, the first thing we, one of the first things we looked at was comparing the costs of the West Coast surveys, which are done using multiple industry-based vessels. Well, you know, what's the budget for, say, the Gulf of Alaska survey compared to the budget for the Northeast Fisheries Science Center survey team? And they're vastly different because we receive sea days from OMAO. So we don't, we don't pay the ship time at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center level. So in terms of our specific budget inside of the Science Center, it's, you know, it, our, our, this whole survey, this 120 days on the water per year is um, the out-of-pocket costs are less than a million dollars. They're half a million dollars. It's $250,000 a season. So it's, it's incredibly cost-effective. However, if you start to look at how much do those individual sea days cost, and if the Science Center was given that money to do with whatever it wanted to, um, that's kind of a different um, perspective. So we're starting to look at that now. Um, and the initial um, price that we got on a sea day for the Bigelow is um, $56,000. However, so we, we in this white paper, one of the initial um, items of, um, pieces of material that the working group was working with was a was a cost estimate. We we had a spreadsheet and we were trying to piece things together, but it got to the point where we had enough uncertainty that we couldn't really build that cost estimate that well. So there are a lot of upfront costs. Um, and then you start to get into how many vessels are you going to be using? And that really starts to explode the costs um, in terms of staffing, uh, complexity of managing the program, the amount of gear that's needed for the program. So it makes a lot more sense to kind of ease into the like, okay, what, what would a smaller scale study look like to explore the types of vessels and the, capa the actual capacity of the vessels? How many vessels would we end up wanting to hire in the end? And then what are those day rates looking like? We have seen day rates for commercial vessels that we use on other surveys, just skyrocketing. I mean, in some cases, almost doubling over a couple of years. Um, so, so I think there's a lot left there to really look at in terms of the costing. Um, I, I think the narrative is that it's gonna be cheaper to use uh, industry-based vessels, uh, but I don't think we know enough yet to, to definitively answer that.
Any other questions? John? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just curious. I mean, it seems like you're anticipating the big low to continue to have problems. Did the previous vessel have anywhere near these number of missed days, or is this boat just extremely problematic for some reason? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't looked at the albatross performance. If there's anybody online who knows the answer to that um, off the top of their head, please raise your hand. Um, and what what we're doing is we're being um, precautionary. Uh, the vessel itself, um, I wouldn't characterize it as being unusually problematic. I think that's probably unfair. Um, but overall, there are challenges with getting repairs done on time, more from some of the you know, contracting and program management end of the spectrum. Some of these challenges are very difficult to resolve. You know, it's not like we can just point the finger at OMAO and say, oh, they messed up. It's not that simple. Um, so we're really approaching this from the, you know, we want to be as precautionary as possible. Uh, we can't necessarily read the tea leaves too far into the future, but we want to know what we're going to do if, if we have to pull that trigger. Thanks. Uh, Pat? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Catherine, for that presentation. I mean, it seems like uh, this white paper is identifying ways to move in a good direction, and, but I just can't stress enough the need for the direction of industry-based surveys and using industry platforms. Um, the transparency that, comp that comes along with that, the buy-in that comes along with that um, is certainly recognized as a great benefit with the Maine New Hampshire Trial Survey. Um, I, that slide that you showed on performance to me is incredibly problematic, right? And, and, and the, the lifespan of that vessel um, in the future is also being called into question. So I, I, we, from, from Maine's perspective, we continue to um, stress the need to move in the direction of those industry-based surveys. And, and I understand the budget constraints and concerns, but um, if, if that's what the problem potentially is, then let's talk about that and how we uh, potentially rectify those problems as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Shao? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and since we're moving into um, comments, I'll, I'll go ahead and echo what Pat just said. Um, I found that when I was reading this paper, it sounded very hypothetical, like a hypothetical industry-based survey. Um, and working as the NEMAP coordinator over a decade ago, we were considering using NEMAP as the platform for an industry-based survey, which would completely fulfill options three and four within this document. Um, so we have, a, in my mind, a pretty apparent solution. And I think that what I'd like to see from the center is less of a hypothetical white paper on how to utilize an industry-based survey and more specific to utilizing the NEMAP platform that we already have built and has been up and running for 18 years. Um, you know, there's a lot of comments in here regarding whether or not biological sampling could be conducted on these commercial fishing boats. I think both NEMAPs have proved that that's incredibly possible. So um, I think I'd like to see as we move into the future, the development of a white paper that specifically addresses the use of NEMAP surveys to fulfill this hole that we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Shanna. Uh, others around the room, as, as Shanna pointed out, we're kind of moving into comments and... Okay, I, I don't see any other hands around the table. Eric, we'll go to you in a minute. I, I just, I, I also want to echo a lot of the... Um, <clears throat> comments that have been made and Catherine I really want to thank you for this I think um, you know one of the last things that we as managers want to discuss is adding uncertainty uh, the uncomfort of that I I want to make an IBS joke for Shanna's sake but um, I'll, I'll I'll just say that 
we need to go into this with eyes wide open and this dialogue I think is very important. Uh, I, I don't see any other hands around the table, so I want to go to Eric Reed. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and then thank you, Dr. Ford uh, and the teams, which include NTAP and the NTAP Working Group, which I'm a member. You really did a fabulous job in, in laying out the document and all the options that are available or on the table. You know, it's quite a bit of information at this point to digest today. And, you know, of course, New England and the Mid-Atlantic will also get a presentation over the next two weeks. But, uh, you know, following along on the discussion by my fellow commissioners, the next steps for all three of our management bodies, our partners are important to address. Um, and if it pleases the chair, whenever you're ready, I have a, a motion, if it's appropriate, or a notion of a motion that we can beat it up and see what happens, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, we we have it up, so why don't why don't you go ahead and then I I, I we'll, we'll uh, see if we get a second here. Okay, thank you. And you know, my name's Eric Reed. I'm a legislative proxy from the state of Rhode Island, just so everybody knows who I am. I move to recommend to task NTAP and the NTAP Industry Based Survey Working Group to develop an outline detailing a proposal to conduct an IBS pilot program test the viability of the program as presented in the proposed plan for a novel industry-based bottom trawl survey white paper with a particular focus on adapting section two survey design elements to current industry platform capabilities. Delivery date for the outline should be in time for further discussion at the spring 2024 meeting cycle for the commission and both the Mid-Atlantic and the New England councils in April of 2024. I have some additional rationale if I get a second. Um, so there's second. a motion. I'm going to, Pat, is that a second? We have a, a second from Pat Kelleher from me. Go ahead, Eric. Okay, thanks. I mean, at this point, I think it's critical to maintain momentum going forward. You know, the current bottom trail survey is the cornerstone that informs management decisions for all that we do for the entire fishing community. Uh, an IBS complementary to the Bigelow is a necessity, not a luxury at this point, given the recent performance of the federal survey and future concerns as well. You know, I, I do know that this is an aggressive, maybe overly aggressive timeline, but it's certainly, you know, like the lawyers say, time is of the essence. And once we get an outline from uh, NTAP, uh, to Mr. Kelleher's point, that's when we're going to have to start working on funding options. That's my rationale. And I'm happy to answer any questions as well. But thanks again to Dr. Ford and her teams. Great, thanks, Eric. Uh, so we have a, a motion here. Uh, discussion on the motion. Uh, well, actually, Pat, do you have anything you want to add? And then I, I, we do see a, I have a hand from Shannon. No, no, Miss I, Eric Reed said it um, very well. I um, don't have anything to add. Thank you. Go ahead, Shannon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if um, Eric would entertain a small amendment to the motion, which I can put forward, because unless he's okay with me making a friendly on this, um, I'd like to see at the end of to current industry platform capabilities, um, the words with emphasis on existing platforms such as NEMAP. Um, I mean, I, I'm okay with that. Uh, DMAP is, is is protocol. The vessel is Zorana R. So it's slight, to me, it's slightly different things. Um, you know, the Zorana R is an industry platform. It has, uh, you know, it's got a lot of experience, and and I would I would expect that, uh, you know, that vessel was the poster child for what we would look for. But I, I don't know if it's, if you want to put it in there, Shannon, that's fine with me, but I, I don't really know if it's necessary or not. I'll leave that up to you. Yeah, so, uh, I, Shannon, I, I mean, I, I think it, with this discussion, you know, that, that notion is part of the record. If if you're all right with that, then if, if leaving the motion as is and, and having that discussion for, okay, good, thank you. Any other uh, discussion on this motion? Not seeing any hands. 
Okay. Oh, John. Uh, John here. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. I appreciate the intent of this motion. I think the time frame, and you know, Mr. Reed, you said it could be overly aggressive. I think the time frame is too short um, to to put something together of the quality that we want, um, and then have a number, you know, have the review process. Um, and have people look at it and make sure we've got something together that everyone's you know, reasonably happy with by April. Um, so I, you know, I think I would question the the timing. And then you know the other thing too, just sort of you know as a process, um, you know maybe this is a better motion for New England or Mid Atlantic um, since the trawl advisory panel is a you know, belong, you know, sort of reports to those two groups. So just those two points. Um, and then just a, you know, correction. Um, I think it's the, the NTAP uh, Bigelow Contingency Working Group, just to get the language correct. But thank you for the opportunity for the comment. Well, thank you, John. Um, I, you know, uh, just trying to think this through, um, you know, we were careful to list this as a recommendation as this board doesn't feel that we can task and tap. So um, as far as our hope for timing versus what we expect, um, and I'm, I'm not sure how much we need to kind of lay that out um, or, or excuse me, perfect the, the wording there. But I, I guess I'll, I'll open that up uh, to Eric or, or others, if since this is before the board now, if if we do want to give this another shot as, as to John's uh, ideas, at some corrections here. I see Jeff Kalen's hand. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a member of the NTAP 10 years ago, uh, when I was a Mid-Atlantic Council member, this has taken a particularly long time to develop and come to this point, uh, point. I appreciate uh, your presentation today, Catherine, but I was disappointed to see that the pilot project may or may not get on the water sometime between now and 2025. I don't see why that year needs to pass, frankly, after all this time. So I do think this is an appropriate motion for the board to demonstrate our support for the flexibility that we need to make sure that the surveys are going to give us the data that we need uh, to make reasonable decisions. So this, I think, in all due respect to Dr. Hare, I think this is absolutely important today uh, for us to support. And I would leave the April 2024 date in there because it always helps to have the fire lit under certain uh, initiatives to make sure that they get done um, as quickly as possible. So I'm, I'm speaking in support of the motion. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Any others? Shannon? Um, just ditto. I think Jeff said it beautifully, and that was kind of my point with some of my comments. We've been talking about this for a very, very long time, and we have determined that it's critical for a very long time. So I'm speaking in support of this motion as well. Thank you, Shannon. Eric? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I appreciate Dr. Hare's comments in correcting my uh, characterization of what the working group is. That's fine with me. And it, it, Whatever the appropriate name is, I'm fine with that. Um, I do think the timeline is is, is appropriate. If the if it should should read the delivery date for a draft outline is less stressful. I, I still want to I still want to move this thing forward. And as far as the ASMFC's position, I, I'm you know ASMFC is an equal member with the Mid Atlantic Council and the New England Council on NTAP. The Mid-Atlantic is certainly the lead, you know, and I, I don't know exactly what the protocol is, but ASMFC is well within its rights to make a suggestion to our other two management partners on NTAP for a draft or whatever. But I, I, I don't think ASMFC is a backseat here. 
No, and I appreciate that, Eric. But yeah, I, I you know, I, I think um, our, our, our thinking here, uh, Tony and I, is that, it, you know, that is a discussion for, for all three entities together. So um, um, w with all of that said, I would like to call this. Uh, and so I, I'm actually going to just ask, are there any objections to this motion? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So uh, we, this motion passes by consent. Okay, um, John, your hand is still up. Do you have a, a comment? No, sorry, Mr. Chair. Okay, yeah, thank you, no problem. Okay, I, I do want, I, I apologize to, uh, to Jason McNamee, um, but I, I do want to go back to Jay. I, I missed him earlier. Go ahead, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, um, th that was good. So I, I'm glad we kind of um, got through the motion there. I, I did have, I wanted to offer just a couple of <clears throat> more general comments. Um, and these are just for consideration for, um, you know, Catherine and, and the team that that's kind of working on this. So one thing I was thinking about, given the um, unique nature of how this will be set up with a, a third party vendor that kind of orchestrates the whole thing is you might want to think about different governance structure models so um you know maybe it's just the simplest of you know it's noah and then they have the um their vendor you know that the, the contract that they they hire for us so that's one model another might be to involve uh, the regional councils and, and the commission within the um, within the group that kind of manages it. So it would be the vendor, NOAA, and then New England, Mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic, and uh, the commission. Um, maybe there's other folks that should be in there too, but just thinking about the governance structure that might want to be thought about a little bit. And then the final thing I wanted to offer was about the idea of the, the different versions of how to kind of set up the transition, I guess I'll call it. And so there was a, a couple of options that were offered. Option three um, was kind of, uh, it reminded me of the Albatross to Bigelow type approach. Um, and then four is just nope it's just going to be a new new survey and we'll kind of um once it gets enough years we'll be able to move forward with it um and so i was thinking about the transition that we made from albatross to bigelow and um the amount of effort that went in and, and the great science that occurred on that that calibration um and it served a really useful purpose for an interim period of time but what has happened since then is we've I think all of the assessments that I've been associated with at least have now adopted, you know, Albatross is one survey, Bigelow is a second survey. Um, so they're kind of now separate. They develop their own um, cues and, and all of that stuff within the assessment. So I was wondering if there might be some hybrid option between options three and four with regard to this, where you do some level of calibration work, but probably don't invest the amount of effort and time that you did with the albatross the bigelow one so you've got something you know that can get you through a couple of years while the time series for the new ibs builds up um but you know not within anticipation that you're going to be calibrating these things uh forever um so ju just some thoughts for consideration I, I maybe folks have talked about this and, and maybe i'm way off base but i thought i'd offer them thank you Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Okay. Uh, I, th I think that covers that agenda item. Um, uh, next up on the agenda is non-compliance findings. We don't have any, fortunately, so we'll move into other business. I'd like to start with Pat. You had an item for us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday at the um, Lobster uh, Management Board, we took up the issues of um, uh, the Mitchell provisions as they relate to um, our current FMP um, for minimum size. And during those conversations, I raised the issue of um, where does that leave us with the maximum size? So we um, amended the motion, included 
um, that language. Staff has since reviewed that and reviewed the FMP and um, it would take an amendment instead of a, an addendum in order to address that. So I think we have to decouple that. Um, and what I would recommend is we decouple the maximum piece from that motion. It would re revert back to the original motion the way it was made. Um, and then we continue to revisit this issue, issue um, at a future board meeting. I don't want to lose track of this conversation, but I also um, I, I would be hesitant to ask for an addendum um, and excuse me, an amendment for just that small piece, right? So there's some other work, area two and three um, trap reductions. So maybe we just hold that that maximum size conversation off um, and address it at a at a later date. Yeah, thanks, Scott. This is important. So for yeah, I I I appreciate. I think Pat covered that very well. But you know, there was an intent by the the lobster board um, and within that motion we now realize that um part of that would have to be done differently and, and and so you know that discussion on the amendment process will uh have to happen at, at a later date for that board but since uh we do have policy board here i'll just open it up if there are any questions or concerns with what with what we're we're thinking here i don't see any okay good Thanks, Pat. I appreciate that for you covering that for us. Um, and uh, we have one other item, and then I would like to bring it to uh, to uh, ACCSP staff. But I'm going to go to Chris Wright on the horseshoe crab petition. Chris, if you're still there. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so uh, we received uh, a, a petition from Friends of Animals to list Atlantic horseshoe crab as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act back on December 21st, 2023. The petition also requested that critical habitat be designated for the species in the Atlantic waters. So we're currently reviewing the, um, the petition under section four of the ESA to determine the petition, whether or not the petition uh, presents a substantial scientific or commercial information threshold. Um, and so once we conclude that, uh, we'll announce um, a finding after 90 days, which is approximately March 19th, um, whether or not we accept it and we'll um, move forward or whether, whether or not we'll reject it. And so we just wanted to let folks know about that. I did send the um, petition to Bob and Tony. So if you want to copy it, I believe it's also posted on their website, Friends of Animals, and I think it should be posted on our website soon. But our point of contact is Gene Higgins at our um, Greater Atlantic office. Um, so we can, if you have questions, um, you can ask Gene um, about the process or where we are in that um, review. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, this, I mean, this impacts a lot of us and um, I, I will, we'll do, uh, well, we'll, we'll make sure that we get that uh, petition out to all commissioners. Um, I know some of us have received that already, but we'll, we'll make sure that um, through Bob, we send that out to everyone. Thanks again. Great. And thank I, you. I want to give Jeff White a, 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 a minute here to talk about, um, some ACCSP stuff on, on what they've done uh, as far as the MRIP queries. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the momentary, um, the, the ability to give you guys a brief update. So earlier this week, MRIP did post an email out that they are um, going to be presenting the wave-based data again on their website. Uh, I know that's exciting news for those doing assessment and management uh, to have access to that data on their website. We've been of course, partnering and working with MRIP over the years for both state conduct of some of the APIS and FHGS surveys, um, and also being uh, ACCSP as a partnership of 23 agencies to help you guys out. So um, we've been working over several months to update the ACCSP uh, public and login data warehouse relative to the recreational queries. Um, we've added in the cumulative and fishing year options that EMRA uh, began presenting last year, and we've been able to maintain the wave level data through the ACCSP website 
um, of the MRAP estimates, and that has been adjusted and is available today via the ACCSP website. So if you're um, interested or your staff are interested, please go ahead and um, let them know that that's there. There will be some outreach coming up in the coming weeks um, to extend on that information. Uh, but thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff. I think that's great, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it was, uh, I think, very important news to to see that and uh, rather exciting for some of us. You know, we have, I mean, take a, an example like straight bass where we, you know, um, put in emergency regulations mid-year and uh, not knowing at that wave level what, what, what was actually happening is very challenging. So exciting news. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, unless there are any other items to come before this board, uh, I think we can adjourn. I'll uh, take a motion for that. If I see Pat and then Shuri as a second. So we are adjourned. We will come back at 1045 to start business session.